Today, I wanna go through one of the exercises that I find most helpful for myself and that I do with every student that I work with. I'm gonna specifically be showing you what this exercise looks like for me first. I'm gonna be my own guinea pig here. And then from there, I'm gonna go ahead and take a look at one of my students' work um, for the same assignment. This is going to be a really helpful look at the specific exercise that can help you get clear on where you are headed with your own style and really understanding how to analyze that work effectively so that you can set yourself up to make the kind of work you want to make. So if you aren't sure what your goal style is, if you don't know what your ideal body of work looks like, you're gonna want to really tune in on this one. Make sure you pay attention because we're gonna be going right into the most helpful exercise I have found for exactly this conundrum and showing you how to work through every step of this process. All right, so first things first, I have here an example of an inspiration board. Specifically, this is my vision board for my work from this past year. Um, I have already done the work on Pinterest to go ahead and really flush this out. Um, I have quite a lot of pins on here, honestly, way more than I technically need. Um, but as you'll see, as I go through this process, having this variety at this stage in the journey is actually quite helpful to me. So let's go ahead and say that this was a piece that was submitted to me in my mentorship program. I'm gonna go through what this process looks like when I take a look at one of these boards for the first time, how I put together an action plan, and I'm gonna go over some of the most frequently asked questions from doing this assignment so that you can actually follow along and do this for yourself. And in the process, if you're interested in working together with me, you get a really good taste of what it looks like for us to dive into this kind of work together. All right, so first things first, the very first question I often get asked when people put together a vision board for their work is, is this cohesive enough? Do I need to curate this down further? Does this tell us with enough clarity about where we want to go with our work? So here are the kinds of things that I think about as I look through an inspiration board like this one. First and foremost, do I see the same medium throughout this board? Are the paintings typically made the same way? Are all of these things paintings? This might sound really simple and obvious, but it is an important first step because oftentimes we are drawn to things like drawings, like photography, even like sculpture that can really inspire us. Digital art is another really common one. And those things can coexist. For instance, I have some pieces on here that I believe are made with charcoal. That being said, I understand how I could create a similar effect in oil at this stage in the process. These feel close enough to what I would make already with that medium that I understand how to adapt them. So that doesn't necessarily have to be a problem, but I want to make sure that any of those gaps are bridged. Second thing I'm looking at, do I see a pretty cohesive set of subjects in here. So the bulk of this board is portraiture, whether that's of people or of animals. I do have a couple of exceptions that are landscape. Um, this is not the primary focus of my board. I also have a couple of still life, although those are few and far between. So as I take a look at this board, it feels really clear to me what I should be painting. Next up, I'm gonna take a look at something like the composition for those subjects. So one thing I notice as I take a look at a lot of the portraiture on here is that these pieces really don't have a lot of background information and they're often vignetted and cropped in to really just focus on the head and shoulders. There are a few examples of pieces on this board that have slightly more clear background information, but it's definitely not universal. And even then it's pretty understated. Um, as you can imagine, there are absolutely paintings that have incredibly detailed, precise backgrounds with a lot of information in them. And that's just not what's being represented here. So taking a look at that is really helpful for me because that tells me quite a bit about what I should and should not focus on when I'm composing a piece. I wanna make sure that I get that head and shoulders, whether I'm talking about a person or you know whether I am talking about an animal. This is going to feel very 
close. We have, you know, that very up close look. Again, just head and shoulders in a lot of cases on this board. So I can really give myself permission to focus on that because I can see that that's a major focus of what I'm doing here. Next up, I wanna take a look at the drawing and specifically with drawing, again, drawing in general doesn't refer to something like using a pencil or using charcoal. When you're talking about painting, drawing refers to the placement of shapes on your canvas, how accurately those shapes relate to each other, how precise those shapes are, whether they relate proportionally to one another. Um, these are the kinds of things that help us to really capture the likeness of a person so that it's very identifiable as them, or just generally capturing the anatomy of something like a horse and doing that convincingly. Now, in my case, the main thing I'm taking a look at with drawing is how precise is that drawing information? And are there certain things that are exaggerated in here? So for instance, I have this Kwang Ho piece um, on my inspiration board. I love this particular piece. It has beautiful movement and mark making. Again, it definitely represents this kind of quintessential quality that I see on my inspiration board where we have a focus on the subject matter, not so much a focus on the background. A great deal of attention has been put on the mark making to this piece. And the payoff is that we really get this sense of movement of hooves and legs like flying through the air and cycling in this galloping motion. So in this particular piece, one thing that is really noteworthy is that the overall proportions of these horses are accurate enough, but the drawing information isn't very literal. We can see places where a leg might have been initially indicated and then was actually further clarified in a different location and was moved. There's a lot of like gesture marks that really suggest that idea of movement in here. And I see things like that as I move throughout this inspiration board, you know, a lot of looseness, a lot of simplification, a lot of marks that aren't meant to disappear and become photorealistic, but marks that are meant to be interesting in and of themselves. We see this here with a Carolyn Anderson piece. We have some kind of squiggly marks that might not be literally representing anything very clearly, but they nonetheless help describe something like the softness of the hair or little bits of frizz or fly away um, that really adds to the piece. And for me personally, um, the texture of that mark making is also something that really draws me in. Next, let's talk about value. So as I analyze these pieces for value, I do see a decent amount of variety, but you know, one artist that is dominating this board is Carolyn Anderson, and her pieces tend to be pretty high key. For instance, even this picture of a dancer, we have some areas of the painting that we know are meant to represent black, but if you actually went and color picked those like black areas, you would realize that they're actually bits of gray, bits of green, um, bits of brown. So even in the darkest darks of these paintings, they're actually not going to full darkness. But by and large, her paintings overall feel very light. They feel impressionistic. They very feel very high key, which is to say that all of the values are quite light in her paintings. Even as we go back into like another Kwang Ho piece, this piece is similarly very high key. The values are all very light. So just based on the amount of real estate these paintings are taking up on this board, we can see this is a major focus. Now, there are exceptions to this. Up here, I have some Rupert Alexander pieces that definitely go very deeply into the darks. Um, Let's see, we have, you know, an equestrian piece by Jennifer Gennari here that definitely goes all the way to black. Um, and we have some landscape pieces. There's a couple of Russian landscape painters that I have featured at the very top of this board, Dennis being one of them, who will sometimes go very dark in their darks. So it's not to say that this never occurs in these paintings, but it is a little bit more the exception rather than the rule. If we go ahead and take a look at one of the other landscape painters on here, Vitaly Makarov, we can see that the atmosphere is really being exaggerated to make sure that the piece stays high key. So I see this more often in the pieces that I'm drawn to than I don't. So as I take a look at this, it's gonna be really clear that a big focus for my work needs to be learning how to compress values 
towards something lighter and lighter, um, and how to set up reference for painting that also stays pretty darn light. And one other challenge that comes with that high key painting is really understanding how to modulate color in order to accomplish that convincingly. Um, that's one thing I really love about what Carolyn Anderson does. What she is doing here in this particular high key portrait, it isn't that she's like literally copying what she's seeing. She's capturing the feeling of looking at this subject as she sat down to paint her. There's a little bit of what we do with our color to make sure that it has that kind of impressionistic feeling that even though it's high key, that there's something really engaging and not like blown out or overexposed about that color. So as I dive into helping myself in terms of getting set up for success values wise, um, you know, getting reference that has the right values, understanding in my painting how to push those values a little bit and further compress them towards something lighter. But I'm also gonna wanna think about some skills around color handling to make sure that even though I'm going lighter with values, that the, the paintings don't feel washed out. And that brings me into color. I think it's fair to say that color is a pretty significant focus of this inspiration board. Um, for instance, if I had an entire inspiration board filled with pieces like this Rupert Alexander piece, which is stunning, um, I would have a very different perception of what kind of color I'm interested in. You know, this is very subdued, it gets very dark, there's a lot of earth tones. But this is really the exception if you look back to the rest of the board that feels like lighter, brighter, more chromatic. Um, there feels to be these like pops of color that are really important. Um, and they might be grounded in a composition that's a little bit more subdued. I think this Carol Nender piece Anderson piece is a great example of that, where, you know, we have a lot of grays and browns. Um, we have green grays, we have red grays, we have like aqua grays, we have the earth tones of um, her complexion, and then we have these pops of cadmium red. That really helps the piece not to feel loud, not to feel garish. Similarly, going back up to this piece by Vitaly Makarov, um, all of the color, except for this little bit of cloud that is catching sun and the reflection in the water, this is all very gray. I might look at this and I might think, oh my gosh, look at the blues and the purples and the greens and the yellows and the oranges. But the reality is that I might be able to give them that label but they're all very desaturated. Um, the exception are these like little pops of high chroma in these particular areas. So I know one thing that I want to focus on color wise is making sure that I have an overall base that has a very strong harmony. That is to say that the colors really all work well together. Like they are individual music notes creating a chord that really rings out in a beautiful way. Not color that is loud and clashing and dissonant. So I need a really harmonious bass and then I need one really key pop of color that's gonna sing out above the rest of that noise. And that's true whether I'm taking a look at something like landscape or whether I'm taking a look at portraiture or whether I'm taking a look at something like a wildlife piece. Um, in this particular equestrian painting, we have really beautiful pops of blue, really nice mahogany, some really rich red browns. Um, but if all of the color were too saturated, this would feel dissonant, this would feel too loud. Um, and one tendency I've noticed in my own work is that all of the color tends to be a little bit more saturated, a little bit louder than I want, which means that those individual pops of color don't always sing out the way that I want. So this is gonna be a focus for me going forward based on what I see on this inspiration board. And then finally, the next technique thing to dive into here is what I call edges. Um, that's not to say that I've coined this term, but rather I'm using edges as a bucket term that encompasses quite a lot of different things, ranging from the application of the paint, so the mark making technique, to the texture you want to achieve, to the control of that texture to help convey something realistic. This goes back to what I was talking about at the very beginning with 
drawing. Um, there's this concordance between the idea of what the drawing is meant to represent and the mark making application, the mark making technique that actually gets you there. Um, this is something I see pretty consistent throughout this board. It's not to say that every piece was made the same way. However, I see that I'm drawn to very similar things. So as I take a look up here, again, picking on this, this one landscape that I'm just especially drawn to, um, we see some areas of pretty thick paint application. We see this echoed. As I scroll down and take a look at one of my favorite Nick Alm paintings, we see a real wetness to a lot of this paint. And especially going into one of my favorite Daniel Keyes pieces, this might not have really thick bits of impasto, but as you take a close up look at this painting, you can really see just how wet all of these brush marks are. And then one final thing I want to talk about on this board is that I do have a section that just doesn't quite belong. And in general, I would encourage you to not do this. This is something I've done for myself for a very specific reason. So the section of the board are these, I believe these are all charcoal pieces. I think technically mixed media, but I see charcoal in a lot of these particular images. Um, these are equestrian paintings done by Joe Taylor. And what draws me to Joe's work is that she has a beautiful way of just slightly exaggerating the anatomy of horses. She has created something that's very simple. Um, obviously she's not getting into things like color, rendering, value. Um, the beauty of her pieces in large part comes down to the drawing and to the mark making. Um, specifically in the drawing, you can see that she just gets very thin on the legs of the horse. She has a way of simplifying the shape of the hoof that we see over and over in her pieces. Um, she really has a clear understanding of how all of the anatomy relates to one another in a way that is accurate, but still somewhat abbreviated, somewhat simplified. And I wanted to keep this on my board because I want to make sure that I have that level of understanding and I kind of give myself permission to engage in some of that abstraction, even if I am working on a piece that has more of this feeling or that has this kind of paint application, for instance. So a common thread that I see throughout this is the mark making, the focus on calligraphy, the focus on thick, wet brushwork, or even in pieces where the brushwork is very dry, the calligraphy is of utmost importance. And so with this in mind, I can put together a plan for myself. I can take a look at this and I can think, okay, if I'm gonna set myself up to make these kinds of pieces, the first thing that I need to do is to take a look at all of these and ask myself, what would I need to capture this kind of reference for myself? Um, what would I need as far as a photo shoot? What kind of lighting do I need to set up? Do I need to go outside? Do I need to hire a model? Do I need certain costuming or certain props? Do I need a certain kind of backdrop? If I am creating something like these landscapes, do I need to wait for certain weather conditions? Do I need to look for very specific geological features? And the answer to all those questions is yes. Um, you know, a lot of these sky pieces, we need to wait for around sunset, possibly sunrise, on a day where we have those really large clouds. Um, another thing I might focus on if I want to dive into landscape is really focusing on bodies of water and like getting those beautiful sky reflections on top of that, or really exploring something like transparency in that water. Similarly, when it comes to horses, one thing I notice is that the lighting is very important. These aren't images I would probably get from being in a barn or in an indoor arena. These are images that I would probably get outside. I would probably get a lot of these images similarly around golden hour, although that's not necessarily the case. Um, and there's kind of two modes that I see. There's like the portrait images of horses on this board and they're images of horses in motion. Um, you know, capturing something like this for myself, that's not gonna be something I do plein air totally from life. That's something I would want to get a photograph for because this moment where we have so 
much of the horse off the ground, that's a split second. Um, I'm not gonna get that level of realism from life alone. Now, as I come down to the portraits of people on this board, there's a large collection of pieces that I could do inside in my studio. A lot of these I can see, for instance, are done with something like a cool light. Um, this takes a little bit of practice to look for, but the main thing I'm asking myself is in the areas of the face of this person, do I feel like this color is more washed out or do I feel like that color is very warm and hot? One of the easiest ways that you can set yourself up for success with this, if you're not sure, is simply to, you know, borrow a friend, have a guinea pig <laughs> sit for you, um, and go ahead and invest in a studio light where you can control the temperature of that lighting. Um, go ahead, set up your lights. Um, in this case, I would say my light is coming from above. It's like this upper right hand side and it's coming diagonally down. The light's just enough in front of the subject that we have a little bit of light shining on the far side of the face, but we still have very obvious shadow patterns um, going into the left hand side. And we have like pretty clear delineations of when something is in shadow versus when it's in the light. This is a little bit tricky with someone like Carolyn Anderson's work just because her brushwork can like really um, kind of break those edges between light and shadow. Um, you know, compared to something very tight, it might be a little bit trickier to identify how hard that edge really is. But, you know, if I'm looking at this part of the nose or even like this part of the nose, it's pretty clear that where my cursor is, is in the shadow versus if I'm, you know, over here, I would say where my cursor is, that's still in the light. Um, that tells me that I might want to experiment with the light without something like a diffuser on it. So just the raw bulb, nothing between the bulb and the person. Um, with something that creates really, really soft light where we don't see a very clear delineation between light and shadow, that might be something where you have a soft box. You have something that scatters the light that sits between the bulb and the person. So your typical soft box on Amazon will help you to achieve that. I've also seen artists use things like shower curtains, like white shower curtains between the light source um, and between the sitter. The other thing that I think is significant here is that the lighting is pretty well controlled on an image like this one, such that there's not a secondary light source that I can see that's interfering with this image. Um, that can be a little bit tricky in studio spaces because you will often have a light that's sitting on the model, but you might have general overhead lights in a space that can make your shadows look much softer um, and make them harder to find. I would say that could be happening on something like this, or the light could simply be just very diffuse, but those are the kinds of things you wanna look for that will tell you how to set up these kinds of portraits. And then I think the final category here comes down to more robust scenes where we have more of the figure. I have quite a lot of dancers from Carolyn Anderson on here, as well as dancers from Kwang Ho. Um, so that tells me that if I wanted to go ahead and paint something like this, it would behoove me to go ahead and set up a photo shoot with a ballet company. This would definitely be one of the more intimidating photo shoots I could do because I would have to coordinate with a ballet company. I would have to make sure that we have a studio space um, where I have good enough light to create these kinds of images. Um, for instance, this particular um, piece, I believe this is also a Kwang Ho piece, where we have these really big lights. We have like the shiny Marley floor reflecting some of those lights and we have the dancer in costume. Well, there's a couple of important variables for that. The first is, you know, getting permission to do a photo shoot in a studio space that has those kinds of windows. The next would be going there on a day where dancers are in costume or asking dancers if they could wear um, practice wear that is close to a costume. Um, and then the final thing is making sure we're there at a time of day and when the weather actually creates this lighting condition. So that's 
part of why I haven't done a photo shoot like this one yet, but gives you an insight into the kind of thing I would love to do. And with that, suddenly I have a really clear idea of how I can actually put this inspiration board to use. I have an understanding of what kinds of photo shoots I would do. Once I had photo reference, I could actually put it on this board um, in the requisite section because this is loosely organized. Um, and I could see if my reference looks like it belongs there. If it doesn't, I can break it down by the same criteria that I discussed already um, and see if there's some adjustment that I can make all right away to get a better reference. Um, and if it looks like it belongs, that's great. That tells me all I really have to do is sit down and paint the darn thing and I can trust that it'll look like it actually belongs here. So with all of that in mind, let's take a look at what this would look like for someone who isn't me. So here I'm taking a look at one of my actual students' inspiration boards. Um, she is inspired by mainly daily painters, so people who kind of follow in Carol Marine's um, style and approach to painting. These are very painterly. We have some painters like Marjorie Hicks, Michelle Torres, Camille Priswadek, um, and we have a range of subjects here. So we start with these figurative pieces and a couple of close-up portraits here at the top, um, and then toward the bottom we have more still life. So one of the main questions I would get asked when you know, reviewing and assessing a vision board like this one is, is this cohesive enough? And on this particular board, um, this is for my student Karen, I would say Karen's board is in really good shape. Um, we do have to make sure that whether we're painting figures or we're painting still life, that the pieces all feel like they could be made by the same artist. And overwhelmingly, what I see here, I see very similar colors. I see very similar approaches to mark making. The pieces all have a fairly similar looseness to them. And what this means is that whether Karen is painting something like a figure or she's going down and painting something like a still life, these will all look like Karen painted them, assuming she is abiding by the standards from this vision board. So based on this, here are some of the things that Karen and I have actually talked about to set her up for success. One thing we did is we took a look at what I saw over and over again from the still life pieces on her board. And that is a real focus on reflective or metallic materials. So we see this in things like the cherries in both of these pieces. Um, we also see them in things like having these reflective metallic vessels, whether that's a copper pot, whether that's a gold bowl or cup. Um, even something like a water bottle has that reflective sheen um, that appears that Karen's really responding to. So with that in mind, I wouldn't ask Karen to set up just any old still life. I would encourage her to put together a still life that has those glossy, shiny, or even metallic materials in them. Um, one thing I can see as I take a look at this, once again, it looks like the lighting is fairly cool on all of these. Um, I'm mostly going off of like the highlight color of a lot of these objects. We want to make sure that she has that right kind of lighting. Another thing I'm seeing in some of these pieces, some of them have what looks like a slightly more reflective surface they're sitting on. So for example, in a piece like this one, um, you know, we, we can very clearly see the reflection of the cherry um, and of the bowl that they are sitting in. There's also seems to be a little bit of a reflection of whatever the background is that's beyond these. So something Karen might want to experiment with is actually setting up her still life um, on a mirror as the surface or another um, reflective surface that things can sit on, something like a silver platter, for instance, or this is something you can also DIY. This is actually Karen's primary focus right now. She's painting mostly still life at the moment, and part of the reason for that is that as we took a look at the figurative pieces throughout her board, it was clear that a lot of these were done in spring or summer. Um, that's based on the light, it's based on the color of the landscape around them, you know, very green, lush vegetation, the intensity of the light, um, 
All of these things indicate that in January, which is where we are as I record this video, um, Karen's not going to be set up for success where she lives to make these kinds of pieces. We don't see a lot of figures on here that look like they were painted indoors. Most of them look like they were captured outdoors in natural light. Um, and it looks like they were all done in spring or summer. So she's going to want to really use her time wisely um, in accordance with that. And that has been what she has focused on for these past few months. And it has paid off really well. I'm really excited to actually um, show off some of Karen's work here soon. I hope that taking a look at my vision board and Karen's vision board really shows you the value of doing an exercise like this. Whether you're trying to find your style or you're trying to make sure that the work that you make is consistent, or you're simply trying to figure out how to set yourself up to actually make the kinds of pieces you respond to and figuring out what skills you need to build. This exercise is fantastic for all of that. If you enjoyed this walkthrough, if you would love for me to give you feedback on your work, on your vision board, just like what I've talked about today, this is exactly the kind of work that I do inside of my mentorship, the Ala Prima Bootcamp. To find out more about the Ala Prima Bootcamp, you can follow the link in the description, and there is also a link down there to apply to see if we are a fit to work together. What we will do once you submit your application, if it looks like it is a fit, we'll hop on a 45 minute call. This is an interview to really find out all about your painting goals, understand where you want to go and what kind of help you need to get there to make sure that I am confident that we are a great fit to work together and I know I can help you to reach your goals. If you have any questions about how to use this process, let me know down in the comments. I'd love to incorporate them into a future video and if you have other videos you'd like to see where I am talking about student work and breaking that down, please let me know as well. I always love getting new ideas and hearing what you would love for me to talk about. All right, until next time, happy painting.